Everybody, welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us for today's program, History at High Noon, the Battle of Moores Creek. Um, my name is Stacy, and I handle adult education here at the museum. Um, and we're so glad you're joining us today. Uh, if you enjoy today's program, we invite you to head over to the museum's website at ncmuseumofhistory.org, where you can learn more about our upcoming programs, exhibits, and digital resources. Uh, this is also where you can learn more about um, shopping at our wonderful museum shop and joining our North Carolina Museum of History Associates. Um, our associates and foundation provide crucial funding and support to the museum, which in addition to many other things, helps make programming like today's program possible. A few quick housekeeping items for today. We ask that you please uh, keep your mics muted throughout the entirety of the program and to please type any questions that you have for our guest speaker into the chat function located at the bottom center of your screen. At the end of the program, I will ask our speaker as many of your questions as time allows. So it's my honor to introduce and welcome today's speaker, Robert M. Burt Dunkerley. Uh, he is a historian, award-winning author, and speaker who is actively involved in historic preservation and research. He holds a degree in history from St. Vincent College and a master's in historic preservation from Middle Tennessee State University. Dunkerley has worked at 14 historic sites and written over a dozen books and numerous scholarly articles. His research includes archeology, span colonial life, military history, and historic commemoration. He is a past president of the Richmond Civil War Roundtable and serves on the Preservation Commission for the American Revolution Roundtable of Richmond. He has taught courses at Central Virginia, Virginia Community College, the University of Richmond, and the Virginia Historical Society. Dunkerley is currently a park ranger at Richmond National Battlefield Park. Um, he has visited over 500 battlefields and over 1,000 historic sites worldwide. He enjoys ex exploring local bookstores, battlefields, and breweries, not necessarily in that order. All right, Bert, I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Welcome. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Stacy. Uh, thank you all for joining today. Um, Moores Creek is one of the most important historic sites in North Carolina. And with the 250th anniversary of the American Revolution coming, uh, I hope people are getting excited and getting interested in revolutionary history. So let me pull up my slideshow and we'll get started. Okay, so uh, I'm going to start by asking uh, two questions. First, can a two minute battle be important? And secondly, can a battle fought in the middle of nowhere be significant? Think about those two things as we go through this today. Uh, just to give you the background, as the 1770s get underway, the American colonists are trying to work through their challenges with the British. And at first, independence is not really what people want. Uh, most people want to find a compromise. And the American colonists are, are going back and forth with the British about, you know, what's fair with, with representation and taxes and um, how much authority can they have here in the colonies versus British oversight. But by the time we get to 1774 and 1775, we're, we're pretty much beyond compromise. Uh, we're getting to the point where both sides are really dug in and, and not going to give. And it's really just a matter of time before violence is going to break out. But no one's, no one's sure when or where. Of course, the fighting will start in Massachusetts, Lexington and Concord in 1775. And word spreads to the other colonies about what's happened. Well, here in North Carolina, there's a lot of internal division and tension between colonists who want to stay loyal to the British or those who want to break away and, and go for independence. Um, we have both sides stockpiling weapons, arming themselves. The royal governor of North Carolina, the man appointed by the king, uh, Josiah Martin, has fled from the uh, governor's palace in New Bern to a British warship, and he's trying to run the colony from offshore. 
And when he flees, uh, the revolutionaries take over North Carolina state government. And so we have people running the colony with the governor being absent and the things that they're going to be doing are organizing the militia and preparing to, to defend the state. Uh, Martin is in touch with British authorities and they come up with a plan to retake North Carolina, to keep it loyal. And that plan involves bringing British troops from the north where they're stationed in, in New York and linking up with loyalists who live in North Carolina. Um, most of them are Scottish Highlanders who settled in the Fayetteville area, then called Cross Creek. And the plan is for these Highlanders to organize and march down to Wilmington. So let's look at a map here. Sorry, it's a little blurry. But this shows you uh, what the area looked like at the time. Uh, Fayetteville was called Cross Creek, and that was the heart of Scottish Highland settlement. Uh, it's ironic, a lot of these Scottish Highlanders were recent immigrants, and they don't necessarily have any love for the British, but they're bound by oath to support the king and royal government. A man named General Donald MacDonald is going to be appointed as the commander of this loyalist force. And it's going to include mostly Highlanders, but other loyalists, uh, who are not Highlanders, uh, people who are dissatisfied with the revolutionary movement, who want to stay loyal to England. There's a few former regulators. Uh, the regulator rebellion had just happened in North Carolina, challenging royal government. That could be a whole nother talk. That's a lot to get into with that. But there's a lot of people dissatisfied with the way things are going. And McDonald organizes about 1,500 men. But only about 500 have firearms. A lot of the, the uh, Highlanders have dirks and swords. Uh, some have pistols. But very few have muskets. That's going to be a problem. The plan is for this force to march down to Wilmington, where they will meet a British invasion force coming from the sea. We take the colony of North Carolina, reestablish Governor Martin and royal authority. And here's a map of Wilmington at the time, uh, obviously much smaller than it is today. Uh, Wilmington was one of the more important ports of North Carolina. And you see the waterfront there and that little building uh, sort of in a center block back from the waterfront was the courthouse, which had been the scene of uh, Stamp Act protests and other protests against British taxes. Wilmington was firmly in American hands. Uh, the revolutionaries had troops there. They were fortifying around Wilmington. And this is going to be the target. Either Wilmington or somewhere in this vicinity is where these two British and loyalist forces are going to try to converge. The Loyalists are going to start marching from Cross Creek on February 18th, 1776. And in the meantime, North Carolina's militia is going to organize to try to stop them. And remember, up to this point, there's been no shooting. There's been no violence. So here are our commanders. On the left is General Donald MacDonald, Scottish Highland officer. Uh, elderly uh, accounts describe him as in his 70s, uh, not in good health. And that's going to be a problem as this unfolds. In the middle is Richard Caswell, who is organizing uh, militia. And on the right, uh, Alexander Lillington. And there, there is no image of him, so we don't know what he looked like. So. Uh, Lillington and Caswell are going to command the North Carolina troops who are organizing to stop the Loyalist march on Wilmington. And let's talk a little bit about the troops who are going to be involved. On the left, uh, we have a photograph of Scottish Highlanders. Uh, you know, they don't have 
uniforms. They're, they're a mixture of civilian clothing and some military garb. Uh, a lot of traditional Scottish clothing with kilts and uh, tartans. The, uh, they're joined by other loyalists who are not Highlanders, very irregularly armed. Some have military experience, but a lot of them don't. And on the lower right, North Carolina militia and Continental troops uh, who don't have uniforms yet either. And it's going to be militia from the New Bern area, from the area around Wilmington and Brunswick Town, so New Hanover County, uh, that lower part of the state. This map shows you how this is going to unfold. We have the loyalists represented in red, and uh, they're starting out at Cross Creek, now Fayetteville, and their plan is to march down close to the river, Cape Fear River, towards Wilmington. We have two forces of Americans who are going to oppose them under Lillington and Caswell. Uh, New Bern is where uh, Lillington's troops will start out from, and they're going to move down to help intercept. Uh, Caswell has his troops march up towards Cross Creek. McDonald, I think, wants to try to avoid a, a conflict if he can. Um, so what first happens is, rather than taking the direct road, which the Americans have blocked out of Cross Creek, he has his troops march around and sneak around the American forces opposite him. And that's what you see with that red arrow moving down to the, the southeast. So he gives the Americans the slip and starts marching down on a different road that they weren't expecting. Lillington's forces will arrive at uh, Lillington's forces will arrive at a river crossing, which you see represented kind of in the middle. And again, McDonald is able to find a way around the American position, avoiding battle. They, they run into an enslaved man who tells them about a river crossing and some some boats upstream, and they're able to get around the Americans again. And in the meantime, Caswell's troops are marching down towards Wilmington to try to uh, reposition themselves and block the road. The British Loyalist forces under MacDonald are going to come up on one more obstacle, Moore's Creek. And that's where the Americans are going to make another stand and try to prevent them crossing again. So McDonald's already found a way around twice. Can he do it again? One really important thing to keep in mind is uh, this is February. And uh, we're talking about cold, damp weather. These are the types of roads that the Loyalist Army is marching on, and they don't have a lot of supplies. Uh, they don't have a lot of food, and, and of course there's no shelter as they're marching. Many of them don't have weapons. And this is going to be a 10-day march from Cross Creek going down towards Wilmington. One of the things that starts to happen is uh, people who are lukewarm and maybe not so sure about this start to desert. And while McDonald probably had about 1,500 men when they started, they're going to be down to about 900 by the time they get all the way down to Morse Creek. Uh, there's just waning enthusiasm as this unfolds. Uh, they're just not feeling very confident, low on supplies, don't have a lot of weapons, and this is still a time when people on both sides are just not real sure which way things are going to go and what, what side they want to support.
the Americans are going to take position under Caswell at Moore's Creek. And this is a photograph of Moore's Creek Bridge with a road will cross uh, headed towards Wilmington in the background. Caswell sets up his camp on this side of the creek, the side that we're standing on, this photograph. Lillington's forces will arrive and set up a camp on the other side of the creek, which is in the distance. This is really important. So the Americans are camped on both sides of the creek at this bridge, which is the last major obstacle on the road to Wilmington. McDonald's forces arrive a couple miles up the road and camp. And he's starting to feel ill. Actually, uh, he's so ill that he, he is, is described as being laying in a bed, uh, unable to move and is consulting with his younger officers about what to do. They send a messenger, James Hepburn, over to the Americans at Caswell's camp. And the message says that the Americans should desist resistance or that uh, McDonald will destroy them, attack them. Hepburn has the chance to look around and what he notices is the Americans are camped on this side of the creek. In other words, they're not using the bridge and the creek as an obstacle. They're on the same side the loyalists are. The creek is to their back, which militarily is not a good thing. He can't see across the creek, doesn't know what's over there, if, if anything. But when he reports back to McDonald that the Americans have refused their demands, to give up and surrender. Uh, and he reports about the position of the camp. McDonald and his officers come up with their next move. They've got to do something. Supplies are running out. The weather is cold and damp. The army is, like I said, disintegrating every day from desertion. McDonald is basically at the point where he leaves things in the hands of his other officers, and they decide to aggressively act and go forward. They set up a strike force composed of two wings. One is commanded by Captain Donald McLeod. One is commanded by Captain Alexander McLean. I know it's hard to keep all these Scottish names straight. Those two groups are going to move out that night. Uh, they're almost all Highlanders. Some of them uh, have muskets. A lot of them don't. They just carry swords. And here's where things start to go downhill. Because in the pre-dawn hours, Caswell abandoned his camp, left the campfires burning, but the troops pulled back to the other side of the creek and joined Lillington's forces over there. So now all the Americans are on the other side of the creek. And in the darkness, as those two loyalist groups under McLeod and McLean come forward, they get separated in darkness. Uh, one account says that the right hand did not know what the left hand was doing. Pretty accurate statement, as you're going to see. McLeod's troops uh, come in from the right. They look around. They can't see anything. They, they, they've lost their friends. And so they go back. McLean's troops, however, make it all the way down to the bridge. And dawn is starting, uh, you know, the sky is starting to lighten, so the element of surprise is soon going to be lost. So at this point, McLean has a decision to make. He thinks that the Americans have abandoned their camp and retreated, gone all the way back to Wilmington. Still dark, can't see across the bridge. Uh, and one important thing about that bridge, when they left, the American militia took up the boards and they greased the stringers. So it's just the skeleton, the framework of the bridge. 
and it's been greased. Bit of a challenge. McLean sees somebody on the other side, and he calls out to him in Gaelic, the native language of the Highlanders, uh, and gets no answer. And then he calls out in English, gets no answer, and then he takes a musket and fires a shot. And at that point, the person on the other side, who is an American guard, retreats back to their camp. And now the American camp is all awake and alerted that the loyalists have arrived. This is the moment of, of decision. This is the moment of no going back. And uh, it's a key moment in, in how this all unfolds. McLean orders his troops to cross the bridge, thinking the Americans are retreating. And so they have to very gingerly go out over those remaining boards that have been greased and work their way across to the other side. He also has bagpipers with him. And we're Scottish troops, right? So they've got to have bagpipes. And he orders the bagpipes to play which creates more noise, which, you know, if the Americans were not sure, they're definitely sure now that they're coming. And with all this commotion, then McLeod's forces arrive, uh, who had gone forward, came back, and now they rush down again. So there's all this confusion on the loyalist side of the bridge as they organize and start to make their way across. Well, what's waiting on the other side? Here's a, another view of the reconstructed Moores Creek Bridge on the actual location. Uh, just a plain basic bridge, probably similar to what would have been there. Upon crossing, and you can hopefully make out the bridge in the very center of the photo amid the trees, there is a long causeway with the creek on one side and a swamp on the other side. So anybody who crosses the bridge is funneled into this very narrow causeway. There, there's no way to cross the bridge and spread out. You're, you're gonna be all bunched together. And as the loyalists make their way over and start to charge forward, they're coming up this road with no cover and this is what's waiting for them. The American militia have two pieces of artillery. One, the, the larger one is called Mother Covington, nickname, and the smaller gun was called Mother Covington's daughter. So we have two cannons and several hundred troops behind an earthwork fortification and you can see that causeway and road in the distance. And so the loyalists are gonna be charging forward with no cover, they're tightly masked, and the Americans will open fire. Uh, Caswell wrote that they charged in the most furious manner. McLean has his sword over his head, waving his troops forward, hit multiple times, killed. Uh, almost everybody who crossed over the bridge was killed or wounded. Uh, there's a few surviving accounts, but the accounts that we do have talk about uh, anybody who made it over was killed or wounded. Some fall into the creek. They try to get back across the creek, have trouble uh, swimming. But it's over within about two minutes. Uh, the Americans probably fired twice. That's all it took. The loyalists are stunned. Had no idea that the Americans were waiting for them behind the trenches. So what happens next? The survivors who were on the other side of the creek waiting to cross will retreat back to their camp. McDonald who's ill in bed, is told about what happened, and things just fall apart. The Loyalist army is 
entirely disorganized. Uh, the men just start to desert in droves. Uh, some of them will break into the supplies that they have and, and steal and take what they can. Uh, they're basically out of food by this point. And uh, some in groups, some singly, will just retreat back to the west where they come from. Later that day, uh, reinforcements will arrive for Lillington and Caswell, and they will rebuild the bridge, cross over, and pursue the, the Loyalists as they retreat. And over the next couple of weeks, they'll round up hundreds of prisoners and weapons. Uh, a large group makes it all the way back towards Cross Creek, uh, actually a place called Smith's Ferry on the Cape Fear River and uh, near Avery's Borough, and a large number are taken prisoner there. McDonald is taken prisoner. Uh, all the officers are captured, and they are sent to Halifax, which is the uh, temporary revolutionary capital of North Carolina. It's where the provisional government is meeting, and they're held in the Halifax jail. And then those officers will be sent on to Philadelphia, where the Continental Congress is meeting and running things from there. And remember, Lexington and Concord have happened, but there's been uh, you know, no other fighting. And no one's sure where this is going to go or if it will expand or not. So there's a lot of uncertainty about what to do with these prisoners. The common soldiers are disarmed and paroled, meaning they're let go on a promise of good behavior. What you're seeing here is a monument to the only American fatality, uh, John Grady. John Grady was killed uh, at the earthworks and is the first North Carolinian to be killed in the American Revolution, fighting for independence. So this monument was placed to him. And there's other monuments here at the battle site. There's a monument for the loyalists. So we, we honor the winners and the losers here. Uh, put up in 1909, when there was a lot of interest in commemorating the battle here. There is even a monument for the women of the Lower Cape Fear who supported the revolution. And this, this could be a whole nother talk. Uh, specifically, this honors Holly Slocum. Uh, she and her husband are buried right there in front of this monument. Uh, there's a legend about her riding to Moore's Creek to, to nurse her wounded husband. We're not so sure about the accuracy of that, but we, we can maybe save that for the question and answer session. There was a lot of interest in preserving the battlefield. It was such a significant site. And in 1858, uh, on the eve of the Civil War, people from Wilmington and the local area came out to this remote part of Pender County and started they had a ceremony and they started to preserve the land. They put up monuments, uh, they purchased the property, and the state of North Carolina got involved and assisted, and it became a national park in 1926, which it still is today. But to get back to the significance of Moore's Creek, and this is two minutes at a spot in the middle of nowhere. After the prisoners are rounded up, the provisional government, which is meeting in Halifax, has to decide how to proceed. There's so much uncertainty. It's often easy for us to look back at it, but you've got to look at it from them going forward, not knowing what the future holds and not necessarily knowing what's happening in other places at the time. The Continental Congress has been discussing independence, but no one has proposed it yet. Well, in Halifax in April, just a few months later, the North Carolina provisional government will authorize its delegates 
in Congress to vote for independence. The Halifax Resolves, and that's one of the dates on the North Carolina state flag on the bottom. The other date, May 20th, 1775, also has revolutionary connections. That's the date of the Mecklenburg Declaration, which is when uh, the citizens of Mecklenburg County, Charlotte, produced a document saying that they were no longer bound by British rule and that they felt themselves independent. That's, that's another talk because there's a lot of debate about what was really said and how accurate the information we know is. But at any rate, there was a lot of interest in breaking away and asserting their rights in Charlotte, Mecklenburg County. So North Carolina state flag has these two, two dates that convey the history of the state's involvement in the revolution. Getting back to the battle in those two minutes, I think a lot of those loyalists would regret that hasty decision to charge across the bridge. Because over the next couple of years, the revolutionaries who are now fully in charge and running the state government are going to persecute anyone who supported the loyalist effort. Uh, loyalists will be forced to sign oaths of allegiance. They can be fined. They can have their, their property confiscated. Obviously, they can have weapons and, and other things confiscated. Uh, there's a real crackdown on anybody who's not supporting the, lo the, uh, the revolutionary movement. Uh, we see wives petitioning to have their husbands released from jail or to have property or, or money restored to them because uh, they're widows or they're trying to support their families. So the decisions made in those crucial moments that cold February morning are going to reverberate for a long time all across the state. As far as uh, preserving the history, Moores Creek is also important because it's one of the first historic sites preserved to commemorate North Carolina's revolutionary history. And I already mentioned the, the creation of the park and the establishment that, of the, the battlefield park and the monuments being put up. That has a long and early history and it still goes on today. So you can still go there every February when that battle is commemorated. And for us today, going forward, we're on the cusp of the 250th anniversary of the American Revolution. As a matter of fact, this year is the 250th anniversary of 1773, which is when the Boston Tea Party takes place in December. So remember that when we get to December, it's the 250th anniversary of the Boston Tea Party. And then the 250th anniversary of 1774 will be next year. Then 75, Lexington and Concord. And then 2026 will be the 250th anniversary of the Battle of Moores Creek. And then other events will follow. So I hope people are getting interested and excited about the 250th. Uh, this is a real opportunity to preserve history, to commemorate these events, to further education and educational opportunities for students. So I hope everyone is going to start thinking about this as we get closer to the 250th anniversary. Uh, there's a lot of potential to preserve and promote North Carolina's history related to the revolution. At this point, I will stop and we can go to the questions. I know that stacy has been monitoring those. I have been. Thank you so much, Bert, first, really quickly. I'll thank you again later, but that was really awesome and so informative. Um, and as you might have guessed, we have quite a few questions for you. So okay. let me just start at the top. Um, hold on, I'm gonna scroll all the way back. Um, so Mike asks, why were the Highlanders in North Carolina just luck of the draw or where there was there a specific reason by the British? 
So a lot of the uh, the Highlanders are coming to North Carolina because uh, there's a lot of poverty. I mean, there's poor economic conditions in Scotland at the time. And uh, North Carolina has a lot of available land. And uh, especially that, that area around what's now Fayetteville, Cumberland County, uh, sparsely settled. So there was a, a movement to bring these settlers over. But as part of the agreement, uh, they had to uh, affirm their lo- take an oath of loyalty to the British king uh, and disavow any connection to the uprising of 1748. Mm-hmm. Bonnie Prince Charlie, Culloden, uh, people, people know their Scottish history. Scotland had just had a rebellion which failed. And so the British are trying to enforce uh, loyalty on them. Uh, so Sasha asks, did Wilmington fall under British control at any time after the Battle of Moores Creek? It did. And uh, I, I failed to mention that the, the British fleet shows up, but there's no one to meet them because the Highlanders <laughs> were defeated by then. Uh, so they turn around and they go attack Charleston, which is, is an American victory as well. But yes, um, later on in the revolution, when the British invade the South, uh, they, they capture Georgia and, and overrun South Carolina, and then they will come by sea and attack Wilmington and capture it in January 1781, and they will hold it for most of that year. So the British will occupy Wilmington for several months in 1781. Uh, Tyler says, so it seems knowledge of the land and area and using the location for cannons was a deciding factor. Would you agree with that? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, Rex says, what's your estimate of the percentage of North Carolina residents who supported the British in the war? <laughs> it, it, it's hard to say. Um, just in terms of, you know, documentation and what we know is is limited, but I would I would say it's not a majority. It's uh, probably less than fifty percent. And you know, loyalism is a fluid thing because when the Americans are doing well, a lot of people are going to support them. And when the British are doing well, you know, a lot of people are just trying to. That's not a judgment. They're just trying to protect themselves and and support whatever they think is going to be best for them and their family. But I would say you know less than fifty percent. Of North Carolina's population. So this is kind of a good follow-up question um, to that. Um, Adeline asks, where did most loyalists live in North Carolina? So there's, you know, there's a lot around what's now Fayetteville. Um, there's, there's some loyalism in the Piedmont, the uh, the upcountry part of the state. Um, it just depends. There's just small pockets. In different places. Um, Mike asks, why was the Port of Wilmington too important? I'm sorry, can you repeat? Uh, he said, why, uh, Mike said, why was the Port of Wilmington, I'm guessing, so important maybe instead uh, of too important? Yeah. Uh, Wilmington is the largest port that North Carolina has. Uh, you know, there's, there's smaller places like Edenton and Bath and so on, but North Car- uh, Wilmington was. Uh, the best. Uh, it had direct access to the interior uh, of the Cape Fear River. Um, Brunswick Town is just down below it. So Wilmington is, is emerging as the biggest port at that time. Uh, Tyler says, can you speak to the sense of the Loyalists and British having older leadership and many dealing with health issues in terms of its long lasting effect on the Revolutionary War as a whole? Well, in this case, I think it's definitely a factor. Uh, McDonald is, is older. Uh, he's also unwell. And, you know, he, he's out in the cold, you know, not having enough food and, and nutrition, probably. So, you know, we all struggle under those kind of conditions. And maybe he should have appointed someone else to take over. You know, the Americans have, have good leadership, Caswell and Lillington, and they'll continue to serve. You know, 
later in the revolution as well? Uh, Ian says, if the North Carolina militia had lost the Battle of Moores Creek, do you think that success would have come when it came with future battles in the state, such as uh, Kings Mountain or a Battle of Guilford Courthouse? It, it's really hard to, to project, you know, because if you change one thing, it doesn't mean everything else stays the same. Um, other things can change, too. But if, if the British loyalists had gotten through at Moores Creek, uh, you know, the British fleet is coming and they will land uh, near Brunswick Town. So they, they probably would have linked up, which was the original plan. Could they then have actually captured Wilmington? You know, that, that's as far as we can probably go. Um, I think it, it absolutely would have changed things. Uh, maybe North Carolina or part of it would have stayed under British control. Uh, but it, it's just hard to speculate too much from there. Uh, Robert has a two-part question. Uh, the first one is, can you clarify if the British troops from New York City joined the Loyalists? If so, was this at Cross Creek? So the British are, are sending British troops, uh, British regular troops from New York, uh, where they have uh, garrison, uh, the main British armies in the north. And they're the ones who are going to link up with the Loyalists. Does that answer the question? Is that... I think so. Okay. Um, it's actually a three-part question. So okay. the second part <laughs> is, um, who were some of the notable North Carolina revolutionaries, i.e. like Sam Adams from up north? Um, north Carolina has a number of important leaders who will emerge. Uh, there is Jethro Sumner, who is a, uh, an officer in the Continental Army from North Carolina. There's General Nash. Um, and, you know, some of these have places named after them today. There's, um, of course, now I'm drawing a blank. But North, North Carolina will raise Continental Army troops who will go up and fight in, in the north of Pennsylvania. Um, and then they'll come back down south and, and fight at Charleston. And then there's a lot of militia commanders who will emerge as the war goes on. Of course, I'm drawing blanks, but. And to some. at least get folks started <laughs> looking around at those, yeah. at those revolutionary people. Um, the last part of the question is, what happened to Governor Jay Martin? Can you speak to that? So, yeah, poor guy's out on a ship <laughs> trying to run the colony from, from on a ship. Uh, he will He will join with the British. He's on a British warship and uh, he'll join the British fleet when they show up. And with nowhere to go, uh, they all go back up to New York. Later on, when the British come back in 1781, he will accompany the British Army uh, under Cornwallis. And, you know, they, they fight at Guilford Courthouse and go all across the state. Um, but, you know, his, his hope is to, you know, when the British Army comes back, that he can be reinstalled and, and you know, set up a loyal government again. Uh, it just doesn't happen. The British are not strong enough to make that happen. Uh, John says, can you discuss the Continental Congress's reaction to the Halifax Resolves? North Carolina's delegates uh, get that news, and they feel, this is a good question, um, that the time is not right. We're talking April of 1776. Um, there's there's still a lot of uncertainty. There's still a lot of debate in the Congress about what's the right thing to do. Because no one knows, is this really going to take off? I mean, are we really going to break away and form a new country? Or is this just some armed resistance that now we've got the British attention, now we can negotiate and um, find a compromise? So so North Carolina's delegates uh, don't act on it. They, they, they say that the time is not right. but uh, a little bit later that year, uh, Virginia's delegates will will introduce the movement, the, the measure. And in that time, uh, they will debate it and they will approve it, of course, a lot. But by then, other things have happened and it's clear that this, this war is going to expand. 
Uh, Richard asks, what is known about John Grady? How wounded was he? Uh, one account says that he was standing on the earthworks and was shot in the head. That'll do it. That'll um, do it. That, that's an eyewitness account. Mm. We don't know why he was standing on the earthworks, um, but that's what the account says. And he was buried right there where he fell. Wow. At, okay. at, at the earthworks at the battlefield. So uh, he his remains are there under the monument. Uh, we have another question on what are your thoughts on why most regulators were loyalists? And of course, most of Tryon's army became Whigs slash continental leaders. So there's the, the regulator rebellion uh, just a few years earlier, which leads to the battle at Alamance. And it's complicated. <laughs> so a lot of those regulators after the battle of Alamance, you know, the, the the leaders are, are, are arrested and, um, you know, the rebellion against corrupt government and, and uh, things like that is, is crushed by the, the royal governor and the, the colony's militia. Uh, a lot of those regulators will disperse. They'll move away. They'll move further west to the frontier. They'll move into South Carolina. They'll, they'll just get out of the area. And so I think some will side with the loyalists but not all some will side with the revolutionaries when the revolution starts um, and a lot of it comes down to personal circumstances and personal choices i think it's hard to categorize the group as doing one thing or the other understandably um just kind of to follow up on that loray asks approximately how many regulators uh were a part of the action at morris creek bridge do you know so i'm trying to remember i think it's a uh like under a hundred. It, it's not a lot. Not a lot. Uh, Laura asks, you mentioned the legend of Polly Slocum. Um, there are some sources that believe her recollection was riding to another battle site, not Morse Creek Bridge. Do you have any opinion on that? I'm glad someone asked that because <laughs> I sort of I sort of threw it out there. Um, so uh, their graves, uh, her, her, her husband's grave and, and her grave were moved in the early 20th century to the battlefield with the monument uh, because the, the local tradition was that she um, she had a dream that her husband, who was in the militia, was killed at the battle. And so, or in the tradition, she wakes up, rides by herself dozens of miles, gets there at dawn, finds that he is not killed or wounded, but she does nurse the other wounded and then goes home and you know, happy ending. But uh, myself and some other historians have looked into it. And uh, number one, um, they would have been really young. I mean, really young to have been married and had children and, and all the rest of the story uh, in 1776. Um, uh, his service records show that he was in the militia later. And what uh, my friend Chris Fonville, uh, professor at UNC Wilmington, uh, feel is that the story might be about the Battle of Rockish Creek, which is a little bit later. Uh, he was there. Uh, she would have, you know, they, by then they had children for sure. We know that. So more of the story is in line. And she may have ridden to that battle site to find him and nurse the wounded. So, yes, uh, a lot of us think that that's probably the case. But the monument is there <laughs> and it, it does serve the purpose to draw attention to the women who contributed uh, during the revolution. Uh, someone asks if you can tell us why North Carolina and South Carolina were designated as separate uh, colonies. Um, I'm not an expert on that, but I, I believe it was about 1712. Do you know, Stacy? I'm going to I'm going to defer to you. This is your <laughs> this is your area of expertise. Maybe someone else <laughs> on here knows. I think it was about 1712. It was one colony. Right. And it was found to just be too large. And uh, the proprietors who who owned owned the colony it was not a royal 
British colony. Um, and so it was divided. Uh, someone on here might know more than, than that and can throw out some other information. Uh, we have a question about uh, William Tryon. Um, they said they think that William Tryon was the royal governor of North Carolina. Can you comment about his time during his stay here in the state? So Tryon was the royal governor of North Carolina, and he built that little place in New Bern. Um, he was governor during the the pre-war protests, as as tensions are building with England, and you have um, public protests like you know mobs gathering in the street and intimidating British officials and protesting British taxes. Uh, he is the governor at that time, and he is trying to assert lo royal authority. Uh, there's a couple times when he's in Wilmington, and there are mobs who are protesting. Uh, before the revolution breaks out, he's transferred to New York. So he becomes the, the royal governor of New York. Uh, so he's not in North Carolina uh, when all this starts. Um, I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, Rex says, text on the Grady Monument at Moore's Creek says the battle was the first victory by the Americans in the Revolutionary War. Is that true, do you know? In North Carolina, <laughs> yeah, because Lexington and Concord have already happened, uh, and Bunker Hill, they were the year before. Uh, somebody said, uh, Lorraine said 1712. You were right, Bert. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let me just make sure. Hold on, we have a lot of questions. Uh, we have one from Steve that says, were the Continentals at Moores Creek associated with a specific regiment? Yes. So the, the provisional government had already taken a step of, of raising troops. So there's the militia who are already there. Um, the militia is, is mandated by colonial law. Every county has militia. But uh, as, as things are, are, are heating up and you know news happens, news comes of Lexington and Concord, North Carolina will raise regular Continental Army troops who will, the goal is for them to be sent north to join Washington, uh, who's in Pennsylvania at the time. So it's the first and second North Carolina Continental regiments that are under Caswell, uh, and they arrive after the battle. They arrive literally hours after it was over. They don't have uniforms. They're wearing their civilian clothing. Uh, but they will later be sent up to Pennsylvania and go through Brandywine, Valley Forge, and all of that. And they'll have uniforms by then. Um, so this is just a general um, FYI. We had a couple of folks ask about what uh, North Carolina is doing to celebrate the 250th. Um, the department actually has an entire website devoted to this where you can find more information about all of the things going on to celebrate this anniversary. Um, it's America250.nc.gov. And that's where you can stay up to date on all of the things that we're offering um, for this important anniversary that we have coming up. Um, I, Bert, I think those are all the questions from the chat right now. So many messages of, of gratitude for you and excitement and just how much people enjoyed uh, listening to you today. We really appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Thanks for having me. Um, and thank you to all those of you who joined us today. Um, just a heads up, we hope to see you at our next adult program that is taking place virtually tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. History and Highballs, All American Ruins. Um, in the meantime, we hope all of you have a great rest of your day. We'll see you soon. Bye, everybody.